Hello, we welcome you to the program today. The title of the lesson, Called to Blessing. It's based on 1 Peter 3, verses 8 to 12. We invite you to turn in your Bibles and follow along as we study today. The Apostle Peter taught the brethren, his fellow Christians, concerning living before the world with honorable conduct, doing good. He wrote in 1 Peter 2, 11 to 12, Beloved, he cared for them. I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, we are like sojourners and pilgrims in this world. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through, we sometimes sing. He said, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. And when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. You set an example, whether positive or negative. What will your example be for Christ? Are you letting your light shine before the world, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven? We hope so. Peter taught in Verses 13 to 17, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake and to do good. And so if a citizen be a law-abiding citizen as a Christian, in as much as you can do so without violating the word of God, servants were called to be submissive to their masters. If one was a Christian who happened to be a, ma a servant, he was to be submissive to his master. And if because of conscience towards God, he was to endure suffering for good, for doing good. Verses 18 to 20. Peter gave Christ who suffered for us as an example, who committed himself to God, committed no sin, and bore our sins that we might live for righteousness, verses 21 to 25. Christ Jesus suffered for us. He died for our sins on the cross. He gave him as an example of one who suffered, who committed himself to God. Perhaps you know people who are committed to something. They are very devoted, devout. And so be committed to God, as was Christ. Jesus died for us so that we can live for righteousness. Wives were called to be submissive to their own husbands, writing of their chaste conduct and doing good in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 3. And husbands, too, were likewise to do good, and they were called to dwell with their wives with understanding and to give them honor, verse 7. And so people of various groups who were Christians were to submit to God and, and be submissive to other people and do the things that were pleasing in his sight, regardless of what others might say or do. Today, we'll begin with our first point, be of one mind, and it's taken from 1 Peter 3 and verse 8, the first part of the passage. Finally, this is not the end of the epistle, of course. However, this is the end of Peter's instructions to servants, wives, and husbands, and verses 11 through chapter 3, verse 7. In this section, Peter will address individual Christians, his brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, and their relationship to each other, 1 Peter 3, 8-12. to And so, finally, all of you be of one mind. Be of one mind. The idiom means to be in agreement. Have unity of thought or mind. Paul, in his epistles, also wrote concerning being of one mind. 
of having the same mind or being like-minded. And so he's writing to Christians to be of one mind in Christ, of one mind in living according to the faith of Christ, that we all believe in Christ and that we follow him, his teaching. Romans 12, verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another, Paul wrote. And in Romans 15, 5 to 6, be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. There's the qualifier. Be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. That with one mind, he says that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 5 to 6. As Christians, we are committed to, to serving and praising God. We come together every week. We come together each Lord's Day to, to worship God, to observe the Lord's Supper, to sing and pray and, and engage in preaching and teaching and giving as we've been prospered. We do these various acts of worship together as one, one mind, one body, worshiping the one Lord, one God and Father. Be perfectly joined together in the same mind, he said, 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, perfectly or completely holy. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Philippians 1, 12, stand fast or stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in Philippians 2 and verse 2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And so we are to be of one mind in Christ, such as when we come together to worship, that we praise God together as his people. And so have one mind. He said, having compassion for one another. The term for having compassion can be translated as have sympathy or to be sympathetic for one another. Vine, in his dictionary, defined the term as one that denotes suffering with. With compassion, there, uh, with compassion, not only is there concern for someone who is suffering, there is also the desire to alleviate or relieve the suffering. Sadly, we may not be able to remove the cause or completely alleviate the one in need. However, with believers, we may encourage them in the hope of heaven. Sometimes simply being there with someone can be very positive, especially as a Christian, as Christians, we may encourage each other to remain faithful despite the things that arise, knowing that heaven awaits us, that one day we will be with the Lord, together with him. Paul described the church of Christ as the body, the body of Christ, being one body with many members, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. Just as a body, a human body, has a head and many members, Likewise, the church has a head and many members. We follow our head as Christians, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 26, Paul wrote there that there should be no schism or schism in the body, no division, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And so we see in both a, a negative and a positive way 
of having compassion with one another. Yes, of suffering with, but also rejoicing with. That though the body has many members, that we care for each and every one of those members. We have the same care for one another. If one member of the body of Christ suffers, then we suffer with it. And if one member of the body of Christ is honored, well, all the members rejoice with it. And so be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Second, love as brothers. First Peter 3, verse 8, the second part of that passage. Love as brothers. Christians are called to love other members of the church. Peter wrote concerning brotherly love. In 1 Peter 1, 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. 1 Peter 1, 22. In 2 Peter 1, 7, he gives a list of various qualities, beginning by saying, add to your faith, and one of those qualities is brotherly kindness. Add to your faith brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. The city Philadelphia is from a term meaning brotherly love. And love in this passage in verse 7, agape, the kind of love that desires what's best for another. And so the affection that we have, the kindness, the love that we have for brothers and sisters in Christ, and also our love uh, for one another, desiring what is best. Paul also wrote concerning brotherly love. In Romans 12 and verse 10, he said, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 9, he said, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And so there was no need, he said, to write to them about brotherly love, and yet he went ahead and wrote anyway, uh, teaching them to love one another, the will of God. And Hebrews we read how believers are exhorted, let brotherly love continue, Hebrews 13 and 1. In previous chapter, we see the faith chapter of various examples of faith. By faith, people obeyed, men and women. And there were some who were forsaking the assembling of themselves together. But Paul, we see the writer exhorting them to not do so, but to continue. And in this passage, let. And so the idea of a command instructs them to continue to love each other as brothers, sisters in Christ. Let brotherly love continue. Sometimes in times of hard, hardship, uh, the love of some can grow cold. In 1 Peter 3.8, he said, be tenderhearted. The same word is used by Paul in Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. To be tender-hearted is related to having compassion. While the hard-hearted lacks sympathy, the tender-hearted is easily moved by another's suffering, caring, compassionate. If someone is hard-hearted, they are unmoved. They, they simply do not have room for you and their heart. But someone who is tender-hearted or soft-hearted, someone who, who is touched and who is easily moved toward another, to feel for each other, to care. Verse 8, be courteous. The term, according to Thayer, may mean friendly, kind. 
In Acts 28, verse 7, we see this term used in relationship to a, a man named Publius who entertained Paul and others who were shipwrecked courteously or hospitably, kindly, for a period of three days. And so he provided for them. Other manuscripts read humble. And so in your Bible, you may see the word humble here instead of courteous. But both courteous and humble are related. Mounts in his dictionary defines humble as being humble-minded. To be humble in spirit, which leads one to be kind, is the opposite of pride. Proverbs 29, 23. If one is humble or humble in spirit, this leads one to be kind, friendly, courteous toward another. But if one is arrogant or haughty, prideful, this leads one to, to be the opposite, maybe even to be cruel or rude. Thinking only of oneself, of being self-seeking, selfish, rather than altruistic. Be courteous, and so being humble, but kind to one another. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5 and 5, be clothed with humility. We put clothes on in the morning before we leave the house. Figuratively, he said, be clothed with humility. What, do the, what does the world see? It's not about showing off, but of living humbly before God. Be clothed with humility, and in do so, doing so, of setting the example that God would have us to set. He said, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter quoted from the scripture, Proverbs 3, 34, surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. Of course, one who is, is proud is sometimes scornful of others. But someone who is humble is someone who is courteous and kind and friendly. Who cares for others? Being proud and scornful is the opposite of being humble and courteous or kind. Paul exhorted the brethren in Ephesians 4, verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. And so all lowliness, be humble, meek, and gentle. Of course, the opposite of being in lowliness and gentleness might, might be in uh, pride and, and harshness, with long suffering or patience. Bearing with or practicing forbearance, being forbearing with one another. Of course, if one loves another, she or he is more likely to put up with a lot from another. Philippians 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Ambition, the idea of one wanting to, to get ahead, be successful. Selfish ambition that one only thinks of oneself. Who do who who does one need to step over or on in order to get ahead? Self-seeking or conceited, someone who is full of pride. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. For some who are for those who are haughty or arrogant, or prideful, perhaps. They're the center of the universe, the only one that really matters, and and that they put themselves always first. But as we love our neighbor, we love others, we care for other people, that we, in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than ourselves. Yes, we need to take care of our own needs, but also consider the needs of, of others, too. Number three, repay evil with blessing. 1 Peter 3, 9. He said, 
not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Do not repay evil for evil. Paul said the same thing in Romans 12, verse 17. Do not pay back reviling for reviling you have received. Uh, reviling is not a word that is commonly used outside of the scriptures. Wren in his dictionary defines the term as being a, an insult. And so do not pay back insult for insults you have received. If someone insults you, the world would teach that you insult them back. If someone reviles you, that you revile them in return. However, Christ has called us to a higher, a nobler calling. Honorable conduct and conversation. First Peter, or First Timothy 5 and verse 14, the same term for reviling is also translated in that passage as to speak reproachfully or to to slander someone. Paul admonished the brethren in 1 Thessalonians 5.15, see that no one renders evil or evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. To render or to give, see that no one gives or returns evil in exchange for evil to anyone. We might say, well, in rationalizing behavior, he really deserved it. Here he says, do not do so to anyone, but instead always pursue. Well, this really deserved it. No, no, he says, always pursue what is good both for yourself and for all. Not just for you, but for other people too. What is good? Peter and Paul's teaching is the teaching of Jesus. We might say Peter taught this or Paul taught that, but really it is the teaching of, of Jesus, the teaching of God. Luke 6, 27 to 28, Jesus said, there were those who said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Jesus said, but I say to you, love who here love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. And in Matthew 5.11, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Are you willing to, to live for the sake of Christ? In Luke 6, 22, blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. And so people may hate you as they hated Christ and exclude you and so exclude you from the group, revile you or insult you, perhaps cast out or throw out your name as, as if it were evil. All for the, do so for the Son of Man's sake. Jesus often referred to himself as the Son of Man. Jesus was even reviled himself, insulted by the robbers who were crucified there with him on, on crosses. Matthew 27, 44 and Mark 15, 32. Peter said that Christ when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. 1 Peter 2, 23. You think if we were in his shoes, if we were in his place, what would we do? If we were reviled, would we were revile in return? If we suffered, would we threaten? As Christians, Peter wrote, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. 1 Peter 3.16. They ought to be ashamed when you do good and they revile you as and defame you as an evildoer. Paul, speaking of himself and the other apostles who were following the teachings of Jesus, 
said in 1 Corinthians 4, 12 to 13, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. And so the apostles followed the teachings of Jesus. They were reviled themselves. But instead of reviling or insulting in return, they blessed. And when they were persecuted, what did they do? They endured. And when they were defamed, slandered, libeled, what did, he, what did they do? He said, we entreat. They encouraged. They, they helped. In 1 Peter 3, 9, he said, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And so not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but instead blessing. Jesus taught us to bless others. In Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Peter said that that is what God has called you to do, that you may inherit a blessing. This reminds me of a passage in Luke 6, 35 to 36, parallel to the one in Matthew, or at least uh, the, the same teaching. It says, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. And so do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Sometimes people may do good for someone, hoping for something in return, that they'll get something back. But Jesus taught his disciples not to do so. However, there is a reward, a great reward. He said, and your reward will be great. From whom? Of what? From God? Heaven? The blessing may either refer to God's blessing in this life or to the blessing of eternal life in heaven or maybe to both. Peter quotes then from Psalm 34, 12 to 16 in order to support what he taught in 1 Peter 3, 8 to 9. And he begins, verse 10, with the word for. He tells what the scriptures say, quoting the psalm. He says, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 1 Peter 3, 10 to 12. Here Peter quotes from Psalm. After quoting from Psalm uh, 34, Peter makes the point that the righteous are blessed. Regardless. Verses 13 to 17. And first Peter chapter 3, 13 to 14. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Even if you do suffer, for righteousness sake, he said, you are blessed. And so you are blessed even whether in suffering for, for Christ or, or not. As Christians, he taught us to conduct ourselves or commit ourselves to God, living in this world with honorable conduct, living honorably, doing what is good. You were called to blessing. And so, blessing, you will inherit 
a blessing. Question, will you follow the teaching of Christ? If you're not a Christian, consider becoming one. Jesus died for you. Do you believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God? Having heard the gospel, believe, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16, 16, 1 Peter 3.21, and others. If you are a Christian, but you've been unfaithful, repent and turn to God in prayer. He will forgive. Follow the teachings of Christ. There's no higher, nobler way to live. And the only way of salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. What will you do with Christ? We invite you to return next time that we have opportunity. Thank you for being here today. Until then.